So let's talk about storage pools. Cool. So, so the idea of a storage pool, anybody who understands virtualized storage, a storage pool is a virtual thing, right? Yep. So it, it's, it just exists on my network, looks like a shared out hard drive, right? Except you got it. Except it can be whatever you want it to be. You got it. So the way Ceph does, Ceph does a great job of kind of uh, decoupling the the storage pools from the hardware per se. Uh, in traditional kind of clustering and, and data storage, uh, a lot of your redundancy and safety of your data has to be decided at the time of choosing your hardware. Like, um, like building a RAID array or a ZFS array, you got to be very particular about number of drives in your RAID and, all, and, and stuff like that. And even Gluster takes a little bit away from that because you can expand. But even Gluster's got to touch that because it still uses RAID underneath. Where Ceph truly decouples that, where you give it as much storage as it can handle, and you just think about each raw hard drive, it has that available to it. And then you define a storage pool. On, uh, you, you create a storage pool and you define a set of rules. A, a crush rule is the proper term in the Ceph world um, that instructs the clients and, uh, no, sorry, not the clients, but it, it, it teaches on where the data is supposed to live on the servers. So um, there's three key parameters for defining your crush rule that you would assign to your pool. And again, what that is, is truly, it's the definition of how you're keeping your data safe. Okay, and uh, I grab the uh, marker here, and I'll try to write legibly. So. Perfect, so, so the first one is? Storage policy. You got it. Storage policy, what are my options for storage policy? Uh, well, you, you've got two, and you get some choices broken down from that, but there's two choices here. You can, you can replicate, or you can erase your code. And what storage policy here is, this is truly the like um, the defining part of how you're gonna keep your data safe. Do you want three copies? Do you want two copies? Do you wanna break it up into erase your code? So replicate is easy to kind of wrap your head around. Yep. If you have two replica, if, a, a, if, you, if you set the rule on your pool to be a two replication factor, you're gonna get two copies of your data. You only have effectively half your storage so this is like RAID? A RAID, like a mirror. Yeah, yep. a, a, a mirror, this is a mirror RAID. You got it. And the fun thing with Ceph is you can knock it down to a one and have one copy if for some reason that's useful to your application. Or you can go up to three, four if you're super paranoid or you want it spread out across multiple servers. Okay. So replicate is easy to wrap your head around. Erase your code. And, and the downside of oh, replicate yeah. is just storage efficiency, right? Storage efficiency, that's, that's yeah. it, right? If, if you want three copies of your data and you need a, a petabyte of usable data, you need to buy three petabytes worth of data, okay. right? So that's where Erasure Code comes in, our other friend here. Okay. Erasure Code is, you can think of it like RAID, but instead of RAIDing hard drives, you're kind of RAIDing servers together. Or well, it could be hard drives. It could be policy. hard drives. Yeah, true, yeah, true, true. true. Point you set it. Okay. Yeah, so, it's, so it's virtualized RAID is what it is. Yeah. So in your traditional RAID, you take a group of hard drives, you stripe the blocks across, and then you put a file system on it and it starts to write. With an erasure code and a Ceph pool, it doesn't do that to the storage, it does it to the file. I write, you a, f I write a file, or yeah, I, I write a file in, and I have my erasure code, say I'm emulating a RAID 6 type of idea, where I can lose two chunks of my data and still rebuild. So I uh, would have, like in this scenario. Let, 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 and let's just talk yeah, about Yeah, let's our, define our, that. Let, let's talk, we have two parameters. One is K. Yep. And the other one is M. M. Yep. And K is my number of data chunks. 100%. So basically like striping, like I, I stripe it out into how many. Yep. Uh, and M is my number of parodies. Yep, you got it. That I do. So if I like uh, to do a rate six and not four the plus two, do it would be yeah four plus two. Or let's say eight plus two would be eight plus yeah, two yeah, would it work. Yeah. Matter. yeah, four plus two. Four plus two is a if good. If I put a plus two, I have two parodies uh, equivalent have two parity stripes. Yeah. So what this is saying that should you lose some of your chunks, as long as you have four of these six chunks, you will be able to rebuild and, and recreate your file. Wow. So. Um, I'm gonna get to your question before you ask it. What's the drawback? Like why? Why? Why this over this or whatever? So the yeah, it, it would seem to me erasure code for storage efficiency would yeah. be would be the way to go. One hundred percent, you got there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Storage efficiency is k divided by k plus m.
k over k plus m. So we got 4 over 6. six. So I have a 66% storage efficiency, which means that if I had a petabyte, I'd have 660 terabytes of usable capacity in that. You got it. That's my usable capacity. Storage efficiency is my usable capacity formula. 100%. Okay. So that's the world of erasure coding. We've got replication, got erasure coding. Uh, let's go on and talk about the next. Yeah, perfect. The, the next critical parameter. And the next thing is failure domain. You got it. Tell me what does failure domain mean and what are my options? Okay, so this is the second um, parameter in defining our rule of how our storage is dispersed into our cluster. So storage policy define anyway, whatever. Failure domain, where the failure domain is, at what level can you tolerate, tolerate the failures that we defined here? If we, so by default, like the default one that they recommend and that makes sense to most people for Ceph, the default failure domain would be at the host level. You can think of a host as a physical so data server. server. It's, it's one server. of these it's three of blocks boxes, right here. Yeah. Meaning that, I'll pick a, just because I have three, I'll pick a, like, so say we chose to have a replicated three volume, or a replicated three pool and I'm writing data to that, it's making three copies of it, and I've set my failure domain to be at the host level, that means I should be able to lose hosts and keep everything up. So what, that, what this means is it'll put a copy of the object such that it's never on the same host. Yep. That's what the failure domain means. Yep. Two, two copies or a participating, whether it's a chunk of erasure code or another copy of replicated data, will never live on the same host the same failure domain yep so as right. you can um, you could probably connect the dots the next layer down you could set your failure domain at the OSD level the disk level when the idea is still the same um, so disk is my next option yeah okay so and that's my lowest level and uh, so so with disk following along the logic uh, what that makes sure that any piece of data, if I had two replicated, it would mean I have a copy on two separate disks. Now those disks may happen to be in the same server. You got so it. So if a server died, if my host died, then I'm not protected against that. Yep. But I'm, I am protected against the hard drive failure. You got it. Okay. okay. What are my, and, and then yeah. we go up to the And I like the options. way you just said that. The failure domain, what you set is you're protected at that level. You're if you're at the disk, you're protected at the disk level. If, you're at, if your failure domain is host, you're protected at the host level. So I guess what I'm saying is if you put it at disk, don't expect to lose a whole server and everything's going to be and, tickety and, boat. And, and, and these are the two parameters that are commonly used. Yep. Uh, and, and I'm going to say commonly because the next ones are rack. They go all the way up. Right? So you know the cluster has parameters in it telling what you know, when you have hosts, you can have multiple racks and you tell them what racks they're in. 100%. So they understand that. So you could set up to have failure of a rack. You um, why would you do that? Large data center. And if your power fails into a rack, uh, then you want to be safe against that if you're all in the same power in that rack. Uh, and then the other one would be data center. Data right? center. Um, yeah, and you can go all the way up to region. And uh, the a cool thing about Ceph here, but yeah, you illustrated it perfectly. The idea there is, you, you have so much flexibility on where your copy of the data is going to live. Yeah. If you have three locations and there's a hundreds of servers in each one, yeah. the host level might not work for you because what if all three copies are in data center A? Yeah. So this kind of harkens back. Now that is out of the scale of really kind of what we're showing here and what we're talking. Yeah, mo most of what we do, the vast majority of what we do are installations. You know, we have clusters up to, you know, 50 machines yeah. sort of ten, tends to be in that range. Uh, the people who are using Rack and Data Center would be like Google's and Facebook. You and, got and, it. And like but that. what that really illustrates is how flexible Ceph is. Ceph can work for the biggest of the big and it can work for just the average use case too. And, and most enterprise, with the exception of you know purely data-driven mega entities, the vast majority of them uh, fall into the in in the host and disk. One hundred percent. The vast majority. Yeah, yeah, if you're an entity, you can have many petabytes of data, and you're still, you know, I mean, yeah. Let's look at our you know forty five drive products. You take our uh, you know our largest server, 
and uh, and fill it with the largest hard drives available, and you've got almost a petabyte in a server, right? Yeah, exactly. So you know, if you want to get in today, I think in years gone by, uh, you know, if you're enterprise and you have a large amount of data, you may have been more concerned with it today. The density has gone up so dramatically that uh, a whole bunch of this gets gets looked after. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's let's move on to the third one. Media type. You got it. Media type's fun. I mentioned earlier how you can throw SSDs, hard drives at this thing, at SAF, and it can handle them cleanly both. Okay. And this is really where it's done. So when you bring up a SAF cluster, it's smart enough to know that if it's dealing with a hard drive or an SSD. And you can see that if you if you list out your OSDs or type your Ceph OSD tree, it'll show you the media type beside each other. And w sorry, when I say OSD, I'm talking about an individual disk, whether that's a hard drive or an SSD. OSD is uh, the object storage device, the name that Ceph uses. For Which all has things. an associated object storage daemon or a, a, a service software service that looks after each one. There's yeah, one object that, storage daemon per object storage device. You got it. So when I say OSD, uh, I, I'm talking about a physical individual device. Yep, a physical individual device and the software that, that, that speaks and pulls it into the cluster. 100%. And can be virtualized. Yep. And that, that's how they virtualize it, right? Because the daemon is, speaks the same way, so it doesn't matter what you, whether it's an NVMe or whether it's an SSD or whether it's a mechanical hard drive. You got it. Um, but I guess, yeah, so back to this, it, it, it can see what type of device it is. And really the three main right now are hard drives, SSD, and NVMEs. Uh, NVME. Um, by setting the media type on your rule set for the pool, yep. so if I set this to SSD, it would follow the rules I set up here, it'd go to the host, it would make three copies, and it would only ever write them to SSDs. Gotcha. So I could mix, I can have SSDs, you know, we, we sell hybrid machines, yep. and uh, so you could create a storage pool that's an all SSD storage pool, and you can create one that's all mechanical. Uh, Wow. Can you mix? Yeah, you can, but uh, I wouldn't deem that best practices as in you'll get like really fast latency if it happens to be replicated to an SSD and you'd like... Yes, it doesn't make much sense. You'd, get, you'd, you'd see some weird stuff happening and of course like your hard drives are going to be bigger than your SSDs so you can get a weird distribution of yeah. data so it's best to keep them separate. So and, and again that's the flexibility of stuff understanding these three parameters when you set up a storage pool, the interplay between them and what you want to do, because not every combination of parameters here come up with something useful. You got it. Yeah. yeah. 